Simon of Cyrene carried the cross of Jesus. If you have your Bibles and you would like to turn to John chapter 19, I'd like to read a passage of scripture for us this evening. I don't know if it's possible, but if it is, could we have some house lights so folks could kind of read along as well. John chapter 19, and the verse that we will be looking at this evening is there in verse 28. But before we get to verse 28, let me just back this up a little bit. We've been going through a study on Sunday morning the last few weeks, uh, dealing with the sayings of our Lord Jesus on the cross. And uh, we have looked at a few of them, and this evening we will be looking at verse 28. But let me read verse 25 through the end of our chapter, John chapter 19. And if you would, would you please stand with me for the reading of God's word tonight? Therefore the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished, to fulfill the scripture said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And then the Jews, because it was the day of preparation, so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man, and of the other who was crucified with him. But coming to Jesus, when they saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who was as seen has testimony, or testified, and his testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you also may believe. For these things came to pass, to fulfill the scripture, not a bone of him shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate granted permission. So he came and took away his body. And Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloe, about a hundred pounds weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen wrappings with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. Therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Let's pray, shall we? Father, as we come to you tonight, we come with the humblest of attitudes. We come knowing, Lord, that there was one who loved us so much, so that he gave his life on the cross that we might have forgiveness of sin. Father, truly, we are humbled by this reality. And tonight, Father, as we focus on the crucifixion of our dear Lord, Father, we are front and center mindful of what Jesus did exactly for us that day. Help us, Father, to understand with greater clarity the suffering of our dear Jesus. And may it move our hearts, Father, to love you more and more with a greater dedication, a greater passion, that would lead to us, Father, following you more closely, sacrificing our own lives, Father, for you. For truly, as the apostle said, this is our reasonable service. 
Bless this time, I pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Jesus said there in John chapter 19, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture, he said, I am thirsty. I find it interesting as we look at these various sayings of Jesus on the cross, how profound each and every one of them truly is. It could be said if we would consider just those words, I am thirsty or I thirst. The interesting aspect is the fact that this is recorded as one of seven cross utterances of our Lord and amidst that a word, it's a word of precious meaning, a word to be treasured up in our hearts, a word deserving of prolonged meditation. When we stop and we consider what it says there in verse 28, there are some amazing realities that have gone on in Jesus' ministry. Just simply put in verse 28 when he says after this, Jesus knowing that all things had already been accomplished. What exactly does that mean? Well, there have been many, many prophecies that have been associated with Jesus, associated with the Messiah, associated with the anointed one who's come from God. Hundreds of these prophecies throughout the scriptures give us with certainty the realization that Jesus truly is who he claimed to be, truly the Son of God. A mathematician, among other things, a man back in the 1950s by the name of Peter Stoner calculated the possibility of just eight messianic prophecies being fulfilled. And it's fascinating if you look at these eight messianic prophecies. But before I do that, when you look back on this simple verse here in John chapter 19 where Jesus says, I thirst, it is actually a prophetic fulfillment going all the way back to Psalm chapter 69. In Psalm chapter 69, verse 21, it says, They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar, or it can be translated sour wine, to drink. Isn't it fascinating how many of the prophecies concerning Jesus were spot on? In fact, all of them were fulfilled. And this is the realization of Jesus there in verse 28 when he says all things have been accomplished. Everything's happened as it's supposed to happen. And as we read through that passage, as I just did, you see how other prophecies had come together as well. And they were able to, to come to that place where it was very, very clear. Very, very clear. So Peter Stoner does this calculation. He measures eight of the prophetic utterances back all the way in the Old Testament. He starts off by talking about the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. That's in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. He takes the average population of Bethlehem and he tries to divide that out. And he divides it out and he comes to a, a number. And it's a, an interesting number, but it's a, a large number, a very small percentage. He talks about the reality in Malachi chapter 3, of a messenger who will prepare the way for the Messiah. One man, in how many, the world over, had a forerunner like Jesus did, the forerunner being John the baptizer. The odds are one in a thousand. The Messiah will enter into Jerusalem as a king riding on a donkey. How many have entered Jerusalem as a ruler riding on a donkey? Estimated odds, one in a thousand. The Messiah will be betrayed by a friend and suffer wounds in his hands. Zechariah 13, verse 6 prophesied this. How many the world over have been betrayed by a friend, resulting in wounds in their hands? Estimate, one in a thousand. And these are very conservative. The Messiah will be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. We know Judas did that. It is prophesied in Zechariah chapter 11 and verse 12 that that would be the case. How many would that require, and again, one in a thousand. The betrayal uh, of that money being used to buy a potter's field. Again, Zechariah chapter 11, but verse 13. Uh, what is the odds of, of that happening uh, where someone would receive a bribe, betray a friend, and return the money, but it's refused, and then takes the money and buys a potter's field? That's one in a hundred thousand. The Messiah will remain silent while he is Afflicted, And we know that during that crucifixion, 
and their trials. Uh, he opened not his mouth. And Isaiah 53, 7 is absolutely fulfilled. He is oppressed and he's afflicted, but he's innocent and he makes no defense of himself. The odds, one in a thousand. The Messiah will die by having his hands and his feet pierced. Prophesied in Psalm chapter 22 and verse 16. One man in how many since the time of David has been crucified? One in 10,000. When you multiply all those, just those eight prophetic utterances and their fulfillment, the possibility of having one person fulfill all eight of them is one in a hundred quadrillion. I don't know what a quadrillion even is, but I know it's a lot. And here we come to this, this passage in John chapter 19, and it's not even one of the eight, but Jesus would cry out and say, I am thirsty. As we think of Jesus, we think of the Christ who was crucified. And there are those today who would say, well, he really wasn't God. He really didn't even exist. And yet we know historically he did exist, that there is proof that he existed. And not only is there that proof, but you can go all the way back and you can document these prophecies in the Old Testament. Now we come to this passage of Scripture as Jesus is hanging on the cross and we realize that as he's doing this, these words, I am thirsty, show us clear evidence of the reality of Christ's humanity. In John chapter 1, we read there in that passage, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The question is, what is the Word? The Bible says all things came into being through him, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light, capital L in verse 9, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, to Jerusalem, to the Jewish people, and those who were his own did not receive him. And then verse 12 speaks to all of our hearts when it says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And then verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh. Capital W, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, truly, Jesus is God. He's the Word. He is that one who has come in the flesh. And in John chapter 1, we see the incarnation of Jesus Christ in a special way. The Word, he says, became flesh. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16 talks about the mystery of godliness and the word godliness being uh, God-likeness and talking about Jesus. It's absolutely spot on as it gives information about his coming and his character and his being. And it is predictive as well. For we read there that as he goes into this, he says, by common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. And that mystery of godliness is Jesus come in the flesh. He says, he who was revealed in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. Jesus, my friend, is, as we would understand it, divine and also human. If you want a fun theological term for how those two natures come together in theology class, they called it the hypostatic union. You say, well, how is that ever relative to me? I remember there was a, a contemporary Christian group about 20 years ago that had a hit on the Christian radio station. And I remember they introduced the song and said that song was by the hypostatic union. And I thought to myself, huh, I haven't heard that in many years. 
The point is this. Jesus is 100% divine and at the same time 100% human. In fact, the scriptures would go on uh, even in the Old Testament to talk about uh, Jesus as divine and also using terms that speak of Jesus' humanity. The, the deity and the humanity of the Savior are, are truly uh, well spoken in the Old Testament. He was known as the branch of the Lord in Isaiah 4. He's the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the father uh, of the ages, the prince of peace. He's the one who is to come out of Bethlehem and be ruler in Israel. Uh, one whose goings forth had been from the days of eternity, Micah 5. It was none the less than Jehovah himself who was to come suddenly to the temple in Malachi chapter 3. And yet on the other hand, all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, we see there that he was uh, the woman's seed. Uh, as well a prophet like unto Moses, Deuteronomy 18, a lineal descendant of David, 2 Samuel chapter 7. He was Jehovah's servant. He was the man of sorrows. And it is in this New Testament section here that we see how these two natures come together so well. And so as Jesus is hanging on the cross there in John chapter 19, the Bible says that he cries out, knowing that everything had been accomplished to fulfill the scripture. And he said, I am thirsty. Make absolutely no mistake about it. Our Savior was human as well as divine. And in his humanity, he goes to the cross and he suffers there. So we see a clear evidence of the reality of his humanity, but also we see evidence of his physical suffering. When Jesus goes to the cross, there is absolutely no doubt that he is suffering greatly. Uh, there are many Old Testament prophecies that, that talk about this. Psalm 32 is one uh, that goes on to describe the, the, the suffering that he experienced there on the cross. It has been a horrific time. Uh, Jesus went from having a time of of sharing as they were at the Lord's table there in the upper room. You may recall all of that and how devastating it would be just to have someone by the name of Judas, your treasurer, betray you. And Judas gets up from the table and he walks out and the agony begins for Jesus. After that time in the upper room is done, you may recall they go out to Gethsemane. It's there that Jesus prays and he is under such pressure as he begins to pray and you remember the disciples are sleeping. They can't even stay awake. But while Jesus is praying, the Bible says uh, that he, he perspired in such a way that out from his forehead comes great drops of blood. And you and I would fail to understand the significance of what the pressure's like for Jesus at this point in time. There in the garden, as he's there with the disciples, he hears a crowd coming to him. And they're there to arrest him. And they would take him out for trial, and he would appear before various uh, people in authority. He goes to the high priest. He ends up at Pilate's. He goes to Herod's. He is beaten. He is scourged a number of times. A couple of times he is scourged, and he is enduring the pain and the suffering of all of this. Meanwhile, his disciples are gone, and he's called upon after he is condemned and the people cry out, crucify him, crucify him, he is led up that pathway to Golgotha, the place of the skull. And as he's going, he is falling under the weight of that rugged piece of timber that is put across his shoulders. And all of this is going on so that he might ultimately go to the cross and allow his blood to be shed and the death to be complete so that you and I would have the opportunity to have our sins forgiven. The suffering of Jesus is, is without doubt underscored by those little words, I am thirsty. For when they pounded nails through his hands and his feet and lifted him up on that cross, he was still man and he was still suffering. And he suffered there. He never, he never decided at some point, why am I doing this? He doesn't say any of those things. He knows exactly why he's obedient to the cross. He knows why he's driven to this point, and he's driven to that point because of his affection for you and I. 
Because of the deep love that he has, he's willing to endure this type of suffering. His bones, he says, waxed old. And this is, again, a prophetic utterance going back to Psalm chapter 32. And he says, the moisture in my mouth has basically turned into the drought of summer. While he's suffering there, if he could just have something to drink. Not only was the physical suffering overwhelming for Jesus, it was also a spiritual time of great difficulty. We often read about Psalm chapter 42 in verse 1 through 3, as the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night while they say to me all day long, where is your God? We oftentimes, we sing the song as the deer pants and so forth. But let's remember this. In Psalm chapter 42, this is messianic. This is a messianic prophecy that's being talked about here. Remember from noon or that sixth hour on crucifixion day, until the ninth hour or three o'clock, for those three hours, the sky is darkened. And it's at that point in time that, that Jesus has taken upon himself the sin of the whole world. And as such, God the Father has to turn away because God in his holiness cannot be exposed to that sin. And God is distant from Jesus at that point. I want you to think about that for a moment because when you turn to Psalm 42, verses one through three, and you see that deer panting for the water brook, Jesus says, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul is thirsting for you. I wanna have this relationship that's been interrupted by sin, healed back to the way it was before, and he says, when shall I come and appear before my God? Well, we know that the ascension would take place in not many days. But even after the death of Christ takes place just momentarily, Jesus would be at the right hand of the Father. It would not last that much longer. But I want you to think of Jesus when you think of Psalm chapter 42. Because just as the deer pants for the water brooks, so Jesus would say, my soul pants for you, O God. Those of us who've been born into the world as sinners, and that would be all of us, don't know what we're missing when we stop to consider the fractured relationship that we have with God. It is only when we place our faith in Jesus Christ that we begin to understand what it means to be a child of the king, a child of God. And now as a child of God, we can relate to the same passage that Jesus relates to in Psalm chapter 42 because it is our desire to be close with God. Something that is very, very unique. Our Jesus suffered that we might have eternal life. When we think of the words, I am thirsty or I thirst, we see in that terminology how Christ can sympathize with his suffering people. We know that as we look around the world today, there is much suffering. There's no question about that. Our world is a fallen place. It took place all the way back with Adam and Eve, did it not? And because of that, The ramifications are everywhere. Sin is rampant, death is rampant, suffering with it. But as we would understand, truly it is a blessing to know that our Jesus went to the cross and suffered there for us. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. So true it is when we stop and consider Hebrews chapter 4. Therefore, since we have such a great high priest who has passed, he says, uh, through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. And uh, truly, he says, as he goes on, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Did you get that? 
We don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Not only do we have an amazing God, a God who is able to create the world out of nothing, uh, is all powerful and, and involved in the life of humans like you and me, but we have a God who can identify with the sufferings that you and I experience here in this world. Because there is Jesus hanging on the cross, taking upon himself your sins and mine. And as such, he is truly physically suffering. I want you to know that even though Jesus is divine, even though Jesus is God, his human body, his flesh is as our flesh. And the pain he felt is the same as if you and I were being crucified only more so because of the burden of sin that is placed upon him. You see, as Jesus goes through that time of suffering, it is real suffering. It's not something that is far removed from us. And so when we go through difficulty and when God's people suffer, we can look to our Savior and recognize that he understands quite well exactly what we're going through. He's not a distant Savior. He's a relative savior. He's able to understand because he walked on this earth experiencing the difficulties and the sufferings that you and I suffer through. The last part of this passage says, therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. God says, come to me. Come to me. You can draw near to God with confidence, to the very throne of grace in prayer and come before him, and you can find mercy with God. You can find the grace that you need to help in time of need, all made possible because of our Savior and his willingness to endure the cross for us. If you're here this evening and you've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you're not certain about where you'll spend your eternity, My friends, this is exactly the answer that God wants to give you. He wants you to know that you can say without any doubt that you will spend eternity with him in heaven because you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ and in him alone. God's word invites us to call on the name of the Lord for salvation. Ask him to forgive us of our sin and know then that our sins are washed away. Not because anything that we have done would make that possible, but only possible because of what Christ has accomplished on the cross. When Jesus realized that it was accomplished and soon, just moments after he would say, I am thirsty, he gave up his spirit and he died. When that was complete, so you and I could have then eternal life because the sacrifice was made. What a blessing it is as we gather on Good Friday just to be able to stop and think about the work of our Savior on the cross. Just to be able to to stop and and think about what it really means. Where we'd be without that sacrifice. It is quite sobering, isn't it? Would you bow your heads with me, please? Father in heaven, we are moved by the love of our Savior. Father, none of us can identify with the level of suffering that Jesus experienced. It is true, Father, we as human beings have suffered. Some have suffered a great deal. But no one has ever taken upon themselves the sin of the whole world. As a thief on the cross would say, we suffer justly for the things that we've done. We know, Father, that there are innocent people who suffer as well, but none like Jesus, who took upon himself the sin of humanity and paid the price of that sin through his own sacrifice. Father, how blessed we are to know that we can have eternal life through faith in Christ. And Father, if there's anyone this evening who's listening to this this time in the Word of God, It's really unsure about where they'll spend their eternity. Father, how I pray that they would look to the scriptures and make that decision to place faith in Christ alone.
God, we give you praise and thanks for all that you have done for us. May you be glorified, I pray in Christ's name. Amen.